Patrick David McKay is a British serial killer who confessed to 11 murders in London and Kent between 1974 and 1975. He was convicted of five of them and sentenced to life in prison. Patrick McKay is the son of Harold, an accountant, and Marion, a Creole from Guyana. His father was a former soldier during the Second World War, from which he emerged traumatized an event he recounted numerous times to his son, leaving out no bloody detail. It is an alcoholic man who hits him, but who also hits his pregnant mother. He did so at least until 1962 when he died of a heart attack on his way to his London office. The last words he said to his son that morning before leaving were, don't forget to be good. Which his son will not be, far from it. Unable to recover from the loss of his father, Patrick keeps a photo of Harold with him and refuses to attend the funeral which takes place in Scotland. At home, he takes the place of this father and in turn, begins to beat his mother and his two sisters. At school, he is put in a class with students requiring special attention because of his already present violence. One day, a little girl was chatting with one of her friends when Patrick McKay came up behind her and pushed her violently before leaving just as quickly, laughing. Another time, one of his school friends accompanied him to the forest. Patrick tears off a large flower, urinates in it, and then drinks the liquid, with the intention of shocking his friend. This comrade will say of him he seemed to have a split personality. One moment I could talk normally with him and then the next moment he was running off to steal something from a store before running back. Over the years, the child's behavior has become more and more disturbing and extreme. The family moved from Dartford to Gravesend in Kent in an attempt to find some balance. Which doesn't work since the police are often called to the home. It must be said that a little thing can send the young boy into a mad rage. He shouts and screams, which worries the neighbors who end up calling the police each time, sometimes up to four times in the same week. Social services also get involved when Patrick starts hitting his sisters. Agent Amy Tapp will say of him he was very emotionally disturbed. He was like a caged animal and in those moments like a lunatic. I knew he had to be at least interned, locked up somewhere so as not to harm anyone knowing that he was capable of having completely crazy reactions with people. He was violent and he was definitely going to end up hurting someone. Patrick McKay was expelled from his home 18 times between the ages of 12 and 22 and found himself in turn in a psychiatric institute, a reformatory, or prison. Internments are requested in an attempt to improve his behavior. One day he climbs onto the roof of the Stonehouse Psychiatric Institute with the aim of tearing down the slates. In response, he is locked in a closet and beaten, which will only accentuate his growing hatred and violence. The boy then continues to engage in outbursts of anger and acts of cruelty which provokes a certain sexual arousal. He begins to torture animals, including his pets and rabbits. He roasts a live turtle and caresses dead animals. He harasses young children, engages in street theft, and burglarizes houses. One day, Patrick turns violently against his mother and aunt, nearly killing them with blows and after destroying the furniture in the house. He wants to kill a young boy, tries to set fire to a church, and fortunately is prevented. All this brought him directly to a specialized psychiatric institution where he was diagnosed as a psychopath at the age of 15 by Drive Leonard Carr. He predicts that if he is released, he will likely become a cold, psychopathic killer. He was therefore locked up in October 1968 at Moss Side Hospital in Liverpool for four years where he asked to have a doll in his room. As an adult, Patrick McKay discovered an extreme passion for Nazism and called himself Franklin Bolvot first saying that this name would be known and feared like that of Hitler. He then learns about the acts committed by the Nazis and the protagonists of the regime. He accumulated objects and decorated his London home with photos from the Second World War. He even manages to obtain a stormtrooper uniform and has his photo taken with a swastika on one arm. He claims to be a pure Aryan, when in fact he has one quarter black blood through his mother. At the same time, he continued to take drugs and indulge in alcohol. In 1973, he met a 63-year-old Catholic priest, Father Anthony Crean, a nature lover with whom he sympathized and who lived not far from Patrick's mother, in Kent. 
that won't stop him from breaking into his house and stealing a check for 30 pounds. He was arrested and ordered to pay 50 pounds, which he will never do. The two men become angry and McKay returns to London. At the same time, he was only 22 years old when he began his series of murders, he threw Heidi Nilk, a young au pair, off a train near New Cross. Then he beats Mary Hines to death in his Tentish town apartment. In January 1974, he stabbed Stephanie Britton and her four-year-old grandson in Hadley Green. A few days later, he attacked an old vagrant whom he threw into the Thames because he was dirty and filthy. What was wonderful, he told the police, was that he soared like a bird. A month later, in February, 84 years old, widow of a surgeon. She lives in a very posh villa on Chelsea Road, opposite the Thames. He strangles her and plunges a kitchen knife into her stomach at the solar plexus then fills the sink with dishwashing liquid and shoes before leaving. His body was only discovered two weeks later, in the kitchen. Patrick McKay knew his victim. From time to time he helped her with her shopping and did small favors for her. At the same time, he was living with friends in Finchley, North London, and said he was possessed by demons. Ejected by his roommates, he tries to steal from them and gets six months for burglary. In the fall, he embarked on a series of street handbag thefts, nearly killing three people. In Finsbury Park, he killed a 62-year-old tobacconist in London, Frank Goodman, just after the closure of his establishment, and then murdered 92-year-old Sarah Rodwell by beating her to death on her doorstep for £10. In Southend, Patrick McKay attacks Ivy Davies, a coffee maker, whom he kills with an axe. All of these women are mostly acquaintances of Patrick McKay who takes care of most often select women with fairly wealthy incomes. He will say that for him, these murders are as simple as washing your socks. In March 1975, it was out of control and the murders became closer and closer together. On March 10th, he attacked an old widow, Adele Price, resident of Long Square in Chelsea, and strangled her in her London apartment. He stays for almost an hour in a chair next to the body and listens to the radio, dozing off from time to time before leaving. It is her granddaughter, coming home from school, who will discover her and at the same time see a man leaving her grandmother's home without knowing that this is the murderer. She calls the police who seal the entire crime scene. The authorities begin to understand that they are dealing with a serial killer and struggle to find usable clues. Eleven days later, he returned to Gravesend to take revenge on Father Crean and split his head with an axe before stabbing the body several times. He delights in the blood that flows and stays for several minutes enjoying his crime. Then he draws a bath and immerses Father Crean's body in it. Once again, he remains admiring his victim for more than an hour. He later told the police that he was very calm at that moment and that it was a wonderful experience for him. Why did you kill the man who had been his friend? Because Father Crean was kind. Kindness was a weakness for McKay. At 8.30 p.m., the police were called because no one could find Father Crean even though his Jack Russell, the dog he never separated from, was there. At 11 p.m., the police went to the scene and found a nun screaming. Father Crean has just been discovered in the bathtub filled with blood, wearing a woolen hat, his coat, and rubber boots. The inspector sent by Scotland Yard finds the axe covered in blood hidden under the stairs. The news spread quickly within the Shorn community. No one can believe the murder was real. Very quickly, Inspector Kent Tependon remembers an 18-month-old case in which Father Crean was involved. The man he was trying to help and who robbed him was Patrick McKay. Two days later, two police detectives unsuccessfully attempted to apprehend McKay at the ex-offender's hostel where he was supposed to be staying. The owner then explains to them that McKay lives with the Cautry family. The police then go to the town hall to look at the registers and find the addresses of all the Cautries in North London. The first family they visit is the right one. Patrick McKay is at their house, sitting on the sofa. At the police station, the assassin quickly recognizes the murder of which he is the author, just like the ten others. McKay was accused of five murders, but two of the charges remained unproven and were eventually dropped. 
When he appeared at the Old Bailey on three charges, it took the jury only 20 minutes to find McKay guilty of impaired responsibility homicide. He was sentenced in November 1975 to life in prison for murder. McKay has reportedly changed his identity during his years in prison and now goes by the name David Groves. Currently, he is in an open prison near Bristol and is even allowed day release trips. The nature of his crimes is so severe he should die in prison, says Johnson. The influence of his environment was certainly very dominant in his pathology. From the moment he was born, violence was the norm for him. This violence will be accentuated by the numerous corporal punishments that he will then receive in the different centers where he will be sent, making him a man obsessed with evil, accentuated by marked personality traits, and perhaps a neurological problem of birth or occurred under the blows. As we conclude this haunting journey into the psyche of Patrick David McKay, we are left grappling with the chilling reality of how a seemingly ordinary individual can harbor such malevolent intentions. The legacy of McKay's crime serves as a stark reminder of the darkness that lurks within the human soul. Let this documentary be a testament to the victims and a call for society to remain vigilant against the forces that seek to harm and destroy. May we honor the memory of those lost and strive for a safer and more compassionate world.